Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. The Desideratum podcast celebrates stories, the art of telling, and the journey of listening. With narrator Teresa Bakken and her author, artist, and wordsmith friends. Episode 22. Today's featured story and author conversation channels serendipity. The conversation is with author Amanda Skenendor about her recently released book, The Second Life of Muriel West. She shares with us how she stumbled upon a small, surprising book that inspired her to write an historical fiction that then became achingly modern. Kind of um, tucked, tucked, you know, away on the shelf was this tiny little book called "Remembering um, Carville: Remembering Leprosy in America," and I looked at that and I thought, "What?" You know, I yeah. even, then, even as a nurse, I had never um, realized that leprosy was ever, you know, endemic in parts of the United States. In my mind, it was, you know, a disease of faraway places and long ago times, and so. I picked up this book and it's, and what really I think hooked me and said, you know, there's definitely a story here was the people who had been at Carville. And so this was a place where if you um, developed leprosy in the early part of the 20th century, you were forcibly quarantined oftentimes for life at this facility yeah. in rural Louisiana. Like you didn't, you didn't have a choice. Um, you had patients who were shipped clear across the country in box cars um, and never got to see their families again. There was no phone at Carville for decades. So you couldn't, you couldn't call home. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to communicate, you had to write and um, hope that your letter wasn't incinerated in the sterilizer on the way out. And it just, so I think hearing these personal stories about people who were, you know, sort of ripped apart from their families and, and struggle with the stigma. And then of course, understanding that the stigma is so much greater than, than the disease warrants, right? Like people are fighting two things at one time, the disease itself, and then also the stigma. And that's, yeah. it just really touched me. And I thought, you know, these people's stories deserve, deserve more awareness. And when you just said that about isolation and quarantine, of course, it's just hard not to, this is the first time um, that we have a frame of reference for what that even in a small way could be. Were you writing? You know, at what stage in the research and in the process were you when quarantine became part of our public discourse? Um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting, I think, experience to have while I was writing. So I had begun the book um, in 2019, but I was um, still writing it, just doing sort of my, my final writing and editing um, in 2020 when quarantine happened. And it was such, it was such an interesting experience because for one, you know, I think there was in those early days, it was a lot of, of fear, yes. you know, just because this was something at the time that was, it was so unknown. We didn't, we didn't really have a sense of, you know, what, what the future was going to look like, how this was going to affect various communities. And you would, you know, I remember, you know, obviously obsessively watching the news and seeing what was happening in Italy and watching it move to New York. And then we're here, I live in Las Vegas and we're, we're just, you know, at, at, at the hospital sort of girding ourselves for what's to come. Yeah. Um, but having this book and having read, um, you know, read so many personal stories about people who had endured lifelong quarantine and had endured a lifetime, um, you know, with a contagious disease, it really gave me a sense of perspective. You know, I thought this, I knew that for us, this was temporary, right? There was always a light at the end of the tunnel, even if we can't fully even see that today. Right. I, I very much believe it is there. And, you know, knowing the, the patients at Carville, for them, for many of them, there was no light at the end of the tunnel, right? They just sort of had the here and the now Mm -hmm. and the people around them and and 
they made the best that they could of that. And that really, that inspired me, um, especially in those early days when, when there was just so much unknown. Yes. I, that was one of my favorite parts of the book. Actually, you have one of your characters named Hector and he says at one point to your main um, protagonist, your main character, Muriel, we cannot survive without hope. And that resonates with her and she, it helps her sort of evolve as a person. Um, and I do think, I think you focus a lot on, on hope in this book and, and, and she, your main character is really looking for the light at the end of the tunnel um, and focused on cure and being productive in a, in that as a goal. And at first it starts off really selfishly you know, her character is not super likable at the very beginning and she's very self-focused. But the other thing that happens during quarantine, during her stay there is a real evolution of her character, which obviously gets to the title as well. But I think that was just really, I really loved the way she grew and the way that you unfolded that in the story. Oh, thank you. I, she definitely does start off very, <laughs> very flawed. Um, yeah. And I, I wanted a character that would be so completely at odds with this new experience that she's sort of, you know, thrust into, right? So she's a big city girl. She's used to glamour and opulence. And um, now she's she's at a quarantine hospital in, um, in Louisiana. And I, I was fortunate enough before the um, lockdown back in 2019 to be able to visit Carvel. It's still there, um, but it's now used by the National Guard and there's a museum there. But I actually got to stay on site in the old um, infirmary. And wow. I could just imagine being there because it is today even, it feels very rural and isolated. And you've got the Mississippi sort of surrounding it on three sides. Um, it was neat to be there and think, oh my goodness, what would Muriel feel like when she arrived here? It would just be such an incredible juxt juxtaposition to what her life had been like in, in Hollywood, right? Um, and so I kind of wanted wanted to, to set it up in that way so that she did have so much sort of space to, to grow throughout the novel. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good place to pause our conversation with Amanda and listen to some of Muriel's story. This is taken from chapter one, when Muriel is first being diagnosed. She's at a county hospital in California. She doesn't know what's wrong with her yet, but she's already been encouraged to not use her own name. This is The Second Life of Muriel West, written by Amanda Skinnendor, narrated by the classically trained voice actor and creative changemaker, Nicole Poole. The dilapidated county hospital on Mission Street bustled like a hash house on a Sunday morning. Nurses and orderlies in starched white uniforms scudded from bed to bed in the vast ward beyond the admitting desk. Miria, er, Pauline Marvin she said to the nurse at the desk. I'm here to see some doctor or another. Sullivan, maybe? He's expecting me. The woman didn't look up, but waved a hand toward the crowded waiting area. Have a seat. Muriel clutched the lapels of her fur-trimmed coat, skirting the coughing, groaning masses. Children squirmed on their mother's laps. Farmers picked at the dirt beneath their nails. Off-duty waitresses and shop clerks and telephone operators hunched over scandal magazines. Cinema star denies plastic operation, one of the headlines read. Three men dance Charleston 22 hours straight. She stood against the far wall and glanced at the clock. 10.35. She'd wait until 10.40 and not a minute longer. Already she'd wasted too much time on this silly errand. Another nurse soon arrived at the admitting desk. She whispered something to the first, who looked up in alarm and pointed at Muriel. Mrs. Marvin, the second nurse called. She wore the same uneasy expression Dr. Carroll had donned after examining her hand. Follow me, please. 
The nurse escorted Muriel down a long hallway to the back of the building, up three flights of stairs, and into a small room with a single bed. Wait here! She filled a washbowl with liquid and placed it on a rickety metal table outside the door. The sharp smell stung Muriel's nose from clear across the room. What the devil is that? Disinfectant. Dr. Sullivan arrived shortly after and examined her hand, glancing but a moment at the burn before focusing on the back of her thumb. How long have you had this lesion? he asked. Lesion? Muriel flinched at the ugliness of the word. It wasn't a lesion at all, only a lightened blotch of skin. More questions followed. Had it appeared gradually or suddenly? Had she noticed other lesions on her body? He bade her undress and prowled around her. She was used to men looking at her, but not unclothed and not in this way. Lips flat and eyes narrowed, as if she were a vexing word puzzle in the Saturday Evening Post. Raise your right arm, raise your left, sit down, hold out your feet. She complied until he hollered to the nurse for a scalpel and specimen slides. Hold it right there! She reached for her stockings and chemise. Just what do you mean to do? Don't dress. You've got other lesions, too. One on your back, two on the medial aspect of your thigh, one on your... er... derriere. I need samples to examine under the microscope. She craned her neck to see the offending spots. Are you sure it isn't just poor circulation? Stand still, he said by way of answer. He scraped the edge of the scalpel over a small, irregularly shaped area of pale skin on her thigh. Muriel felt nothing, no pain or discomfort, not even a tickling sensation. Had she not been watching, she wouldn't have known the blade was on her at all. He smeared the flecks of skin and tissue onto a glass slide, then moved to the next spot. Is it cancer? I'd rather not speculate, but you'll have to remain here until we have a definitive diagnosis. At the hospital? Yes, here in the isolation ward. That's impossible. I've got children, a ten-month-old who's teething. He passed the slides off to the nurse, then rolled up his shirt sleeves and scrubbed his hands and forearms in the basin of disinfectant by the door. Better for them that you remain here. Then he shut the door, locking her inside. Morning passed into afternoon, and afternoon into evening. Muriel's mouth was sticky with thirst. Her head throbbed anew. Were she at home, at least she'd have a softer bed to lie on. Curtains to blot out the light? A record on the phonograph to drown out the noise? She closed her eyes, and the din rising from the wards below became that of the cook bustling in the kitchen, her daughter returning from school, the baby babbling in the nursery. Muriel got up from the lumpy hospital bed and rattled the doorknob. She banged and yelled for the nurse. How worried Charlie must be, Perhaps Dr. Carroll had telephoned, set his mind at ease. With any luck, Muriel would arrive home just as the cook was finishing dinner. She'd find Charlie in the parlor, drink in hand after another long day haggling with Mr. Schulberg to cast him in another picture, and the girls already tucked in and asleep. Surely Charlie would be a dear and fix her a drink, too. Light ice and a heavy pour. But the sky outside the small, unwashed hospital window darkened, and still the doctor didn't return. The cawing seagulls quieted. The palms and eucalyptus turned from green to bruised purple to black. The distant Hollywoodland sign faded to shadow against the disappearing hills. She tried to open the window to stir the room's stale air, but the sash had been nailed shut. An orderly brought her a newspaper-wrapped sandwich and paper cup of water, setting both down on the dirty floor just inside her room, as if he dared not come inside. She hollered after him, but he knew nothing of her tests, or when the doctor might be back. Hours later, 
Muriel wrapped herself in her coat atop the narrow bed and tried to sleep. Thoughts of cancer and smallpox ran rampant in her mind. Would she wake in the morning with boils covering her skin? Or to news that a tumor was eating her from the inside out? She felt fine. Tired, yes, and certainly in need of a nightcap, but not ill. She twisted the silver bracelet around her wrist. Funny, now that death might truly be at hand, how Muriel found herself wanting to live. It takes her a long time to open up to the other characters, you know, to really share her deepest griefs and tragedies, you know, who really, the parts of her that are really human versus the sort of superficial who she is in the world. And I think that's so true just in life in general, how hard it is for us to open up who we are. And for me, that's actually been part of COVID is that I just find myself more willing, right, to just be authentic. and yes. yes. Uh, But I thought that her character just, I think you, that's part of the central themes to me in this book. And I think, you know, part of the struggle, and maybe this is, you know, true of of all of us too, but for her, especially, I think coming to relate to other people and open up to them, there's part of her having to admit that she also has the disease, that she also is and, and just in general, an, an imperfect yes. person. And, and, you know, as humans in general, I think that's sometimes difficult for us to admit. We like to present the sort of manicured sides of ourselves and, mm-hmm. and show, show the best sides. And there was something, I think, about isolation and, and our own experience with the COVID quarantine that helped us shed a little bit of that and open up. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of little bits of that, like hope shedding your past. Um, These are all sort of how to live. I mean, it's so interesting that, you know, her life kind of stops and comes to an end and yet she really actually learns to live Mm -hmm. um, in this horrible situation, right? It's, you know, she's imprisoned really. It's not even about giving, I mean, it is about caregiving, but it's also a form of prison for all of them that they, they can't escape. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not allowed. Yeah. They're not allowed to leave. There's the, the barbed wire fence. So it is, it's both, they're both being treated and being imprisoned. Yeah. I think the other thing that's really important to talk about is that this was a hundred years ago. So it's really, it's so fascinating to think about things a hundred. I don't know why that's a magic number, but it's like a hundred years ago. Um, and yet these characters feel very current. I mean, you, you do a wonderful job of like using the language of the time and the music of the time, and you feel like you're there in, in that place setting, but it also feels like very relatable characters, relatable people. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad that they come across that way. That's certainly my hope. And I think one of the reasons that I love historical fiction um, and I relate to it so well, I very much believe that, you know, people a hundred years ago or even a thousand years ago were not that fundamentally different from who we are, right? Mm-hmm. And if we can, um, or if I, as, as a historical fiction writer, can sort of show that, that yes, they're talking different, um, that they are listening to different music, certainly wearing different clothes, but that ultimately what they want and how they interact, you know, this, this quest, um, you know, for love and to find meaning and to find hope in life, like those, I think are sort of universal and, and in a way, eternal human quests yes. and struggles. And by, by putting people in historical situations that share those sort of common threads with us, for me anyways, when I read stories like that, suddenly the history, it just feels so much more approachable. I can sort of, I think, I feel like I can learn from it better than if I'm just reading it, you yeah. know, in a, in a textbook. Exactly, yeah, exactly. When you think about it in terms of how it affected actual mothers, you know, I think motherhood is another really strong theme in here. Uh, you have, you know, your main character is a mother and you also bring up motherhood in other ways, you know, women that, that gave up children at birth. And so I wonder also where that inspiration comes from. Why, why did you incorporate motherhood so strongly? I think this is also perhaps part of my, um, my own aging a little bit. I think in general writers, we tend to write about even unconsciously things that we are 
in a way obsessed with <laughs> um, that, 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 that it becomes obsessions of ours or that we just, you know, are sort of grappling with in our own life. And I do not have children. I'm not a mother. Um, mm-hmm. And as I get past that point where I could be a mother, that decision is very, very difficult. And so as I was writing that, I think internally I was struggling with my own, my own decision. Is this the right thing? And I think that motherhood is such a beautiful expression of, of the human condition and of love and of sacrifice mm. and of, um, of joy and pain and all of these things and that no one person's experience is the same with that. And so I think that's also part of why there are multiple sort of expressions of motherhood, um, you know, in the book. Yes. Well, and really just family, the idea Mm -hmm. of what is family is very central to this, that role of motherhood, whether they're, you're physically, genetically a mother or not is sort of expressed through the relationships that the bonds that that people can form. And I think that's a really, also, like you said, timeless, universal, Mm -hmm. but it's it's a great, you know, finding the family where you are and that sense of, you know, what is community and how that defines our self-worth. Yes, yes. And I think that's finally when Muriel, you know, as she's finally finding the community at Carville and, and allowing herself to enter into that community that she starts to really find herself in a way that she never had been able to before. Yeah. I love that about it. Um, I wonder as a person of medicine, if you, as you look back at the stigmas that were placed on this, you know, a hundred years back, um, which are as almost the stigma around the disease is almost worse than the disease in the way that you, you paint this picture of how it's impacted their lives. What do you think that a hundred years from now, people will look back on Mm. and say about today, you know? That's a wonderful, um, that's a wonderful question. Um, Things that I see in current day that we stigmatize, I think mental health is still very stigmatized. We're we're starting, I think, to unpack that a little bit. And in a weird, in a weird way, I think COVID helped us with that a little bit, just to see how vulnerable we are as humans um, to, struggles like that. I also think um, that weight stigma and, um, you know, shaming people for their body size will be something that people will look back on um, and, and realize that that was, again, um, in both of those situations with mental health and with, with people's body size, there's so much, you know, morality that we sort of place on, on these people. And it's interesting that, you know, on the, like I said, I do think we're um, certainly, I think our understanding of um, leprosy or Hansen's disease has improved greatly, but then we sort of just shifted to something else. <laughs> and I do hope, I do hope at some, at some point we can sort of divorce ourselves from trying to do that, to trying to assign moral weight to, um, to these sort of actual um, ailments and, and ways that people suffer. We just maybe need a little bit more compassion. It's one of the reasons I think I love historical fiction, actually, because we, we have that lens to look back and go, okay, we are, we are moving forward. Yes. We have made progress. Um, and yeah, but we have work to do. Right, right. So I like to ask the authors that give me some of their time, what for you is essential? Hmm. I think for me and... Also, this past year, year and a half has certainly, I think, crystallized this for me. For me, what is essential is connection and 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 the community. Um, that again, <laughs> I, I mentioned we we write about things, authors that we're obsessed with and um, our, our obsessions, and maybe that's also part of what came up in the Second Life of Muriel West and why I was so struck with learning about Carville and the people who lived there because they did find this sense of connection and community. And for me, whether that's, again, my family that I was born into or the family that I have found in um, my life here in Las Vegas, those, those connections and being with those people and making new connections and new, um, new communities, that to me is, is essential. Yeah, I think that's, it's so clear that in this book, 
I feel like your attention to relationship and the importance of relationship is very clear. I think people will, I want people to know that about this book, that it is, it is about leprosy. It is about disease and quarantine um, and a hundred years set a hundred years in our past, but it's also really about how important relationship is and mm. how that in her darkest moments in this book is when she severs herself from relationship. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There is the, the hope piece comes into that too. I mean, I think there's the hope of the better future, but community and connection, I think is what allows you to sort of see that hope and believe in that hope and encourages you to find that hope. You can find The Second Life of Muriel West and Amanda's other historical fiction novels, The Undertaker's Assistant and Between Earth and Sky on her website. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thank you to Vida at Kensington Press for connecting us. Amanda also shared a great picture of herself visiting Carville from 2019. I'll put that on the Desideratum podcast website. Thanks for listening. Yeah, Uh, well, it's been a wonderful pleasure. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye.